All right, welcome to chapter 33. And this is actually a first part of a two chapter sequence on um, animals. So um, this first part, uh, we're only really gonna concentrate on protostomes only. As you can see, I've written it down here, even though this chapter does cover some deuterostomes at the end, only because this chapter is really concentrating on uh, invertebrates. Some invertebrates are also deuterostomes as well. Um, but again, we're gonna... So invertebrates, uh, what makes them invertebrates is that they do not have a backbone. So uh, some, uh, uh, remember, these are all protostomes, and then there are some uh, protostomes or some deuterostomes that uh, would be considered invertebrates as well. Uh, the invertebrates make up most of the animal species that live on Earth at this point that we know about. Okay, so here uh, the statistic is about 95%. So uh, most of the animals uh, do not have a backbone. And um, just like any other group, uh, especially those that are protists, uh, they are quite diverse in terms of morphology. So they look a lot different. Some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller, and there are some char special characteristics that some of them have that... Um, make them what they are in terms of, you know, phylum and subphylum classes, orders, even so. So I'm uh, going to start going through this. This is a rudimentary tree uh, representing um, the major groups of animals. As we can see, animals were thought to have originated from an ancestral protist that had a flagella. We already discussed that in the introduction to animals. And the first to branch off are the periphera. Those are the sponges. So those are the most ancient uh, and, you know, animals that uh, still exist to this day. And then the next major group that branches off are called eumetazoa. They're called eumetazoa because they have true tissues. Um, so... Nideria are those that start are the earliest ancestors of the Eumetazoa. So they, they branched off first in that major group. And then animals are further divided up into bilaterians. Remember bilateral symmetry? These are organisms that do have bilateral symmetry. And then they're split up into deuterostomes right here and protostomes. Protostomes are further divided up into two major groups of organisms. Those are Lophotrochozoa and Ectizozoa. So animals that are uh, in the phylum periphera, uh, they're going to be, you know, they're commonly called sponges. So that's why I call them sponges. They live in a sedentary lifestyle. What that means is they do not move around. So they don't have the characteristics which would allow them to move and hunt prey. Okay, so they just sit there. They're usually attached to some substance. <clears throat> so they live in the marine and freshwater. So they, they typically live in... in these are some structures of sponges that are key to this. So sponges, in order, how they feed is, is filter feeders. So they basically filter out uh, particles that are in the water, whether it's marine or fresh water. So um, they capture these in a system uh, which involves uh, some water flow. So the water flow goes through these pores right here. And the water comes in through the sides and up and out uh, through the osculum. Okay, so um, the cavity right here, this space where the water flows into is called the spongo seal. So remember, anytime you see seal, that means that there is, it's, it's a cavity of some sort. And this is a cavity that exists in sponges, so conveniently it's called a spongo seal. And then, of course, it flows out through the osculum. Sponges <clears throat> do not possess true tissues and organs but they do have some specific cell types. So we've got the spongoseal, we've got the osculum, and we to, we just discovered how they basically feed themselves. So they, they filter um, food particles that are in the water. They have specialized cells called choanocytes. Uh, choanocytes uh, look like the following. You can see that they do have flagella. They have these uh, collars, which, um, which look like really large cilia. So what happens uh, here is basically there's an amoebocyte that's associated with the choanocyte. So both of them are, um, you know, uh, not really attached, but they're, they're, they're associated in some way. So the amoebocytes take in the particles and then they're going to process them and then um, give them the, to the choanocytes. 
Um, so uh, during this process, phagocytosis occurs. Remember, ph this is this is how they obtain the food particles. It's by phagocytosis. Remember, that's just engulfing uh, particles of food. And um, inside their structure here, they have basically these two cell layers right here, but uh, this, this non-cellular layer right here between the two cellulators is called a mesoheal. It's called a mesoheal. Again, it's non-cellular. It's just a, a tissue. Okay. Inside the tissue, they have these spicules. Okay, the spicules are made up of usually it could be silica or calcium, uh, some form of calcium, and it provides some strength to the structure. Um, as you can see, we've already discussed the amoebocytes. Okay, so those uh, take part in feeding. Okay, so they uh, digest the food and um, they provide it from the, uh, uh, the choanocytes. Most sponges have both male and female um, sexual parts. Okay, what this the the name for this is is um, hermaphroditic. So uh, most sponges are hermaphrodites. So they have both male and female structures for reproduction. Here we can see a uh, a type of sponge here. So they're they're quite beautiful. Then the next to branch off, remember uh, the sponges, they do not have true tissues. Now we're starting to those egg organisms, uh, th those groups of, of animals that have true tissues. So all the rest of them that actually follow this are considered eumetazoa, so they, they have true tissues. The first to branch off are the nideria. Of course, this would make it the oldest group within that clade, uh, eumetazoa. Nigerians, they can um, live in a, in a couple different kind of lifestyles during their uh, their uh, life cycle. Now, um, not all of them switch between these two, but they can be sessile, which is called the polyp. They could be motile, which is called the medusa. Okay, if they have both, they would be considered bimorphic. Okay, so bimorphic means that they exist in both forms during their life cycle. Some examples of these are like jellies, jellyfishes, corals, and, and hydra. Their body plan is diploblastic, meaning that they have true or two uh, um, uh, uh, germ layers during development. And their symmetry is radial. Remember radial symmetry. There, we're not. We we haven't got to the bilateral sim, bilaterally symmetric animals yet, so we're dealing with radial radial symmetry. Now, um, <clears throat> they have, uh, basically, they're kind of filter feeders as well. They, they take in, they have a mouth, um, which is the same spot as the anus. So they have one opening in which, you know, food comes in and uh, waste goes out. The opening leads to a cavity called the gastrovascular cavity. Now, the the surface of the gastrovascular cavity, so this, this tissue that lines the gastrovascular cavity is called a gastrodermis. So this here shows uh, two examples of nidaria. So this is a um, this is a hydra right here. And then, um, well, this would be an, an example of two of the different life stages. So we have the polyp, which again, um, this is the sessile stage, so it's going to be attached to some sort of surface. So it, it doesn't move around. The moving part of the life cycle is the medusa. Okay, this is what you would normally see as, as a you would think is a jellyfish. Okay, so but the term for that, the correct term for that, is the medusa. As I was saying, the tissue that lines the gastrovascular uh, cavity is called the gastrodermis. So dermis would be like surface tissue or some sort of uh, tissue um, cells, and um, gastro meaning for gastrovascular cavity. They have a tissue in between the epidermis, which is the surface tissue, okay, and the gastrodermis. Okay, so they have the epidermis, which is on the surface on the outside, and the gastrodermis, which lines the inside or, um, you know, where they, they digest. It's called a mesoglia. Okay, so the mesoglia is that tissue in between the gastrodermis and the epidermis. The the modal form or the medusa has tentacles. Okay, so you can see these tentacles right here. 
uh, across the bottom where the opening is. So the tentacles actually exist near the openings of these, as you can see. Okay, so the polyp also has tentacles. Both of them help them feed. And um, of course, the, the medusa, with the medusa, which is the, the modal form, it helps them move around. So um, the polyp, like I said, is sessile. It's going to adhere to some substrate, and then it's just going to sit there and kind of filter feed. The medusa is, is able to move around freely. <clears throat> A little bit more about the um, the gastrovascular cavity. So this this is the cavity. This is this is where this is basically the digestive system. Okay, so this is this is where it's feeding onto stuff. So there's only one opening uh, leading to the gastrovascular cavity, and it serves as both the mouth mouth and the anus. <clears throat> Nidarians are carnivores, so they they ha they use these tentacles to capture prey. Um, so as we can see, we have a tentacle. Inside the tentacles, we have these uh, specialized cells. Okay, so we can see one right here. It's pointing to it. It's called the nematocyst or uh, nidocyte. Okay, so the whole site is called the uh, nidocyte or the cell. And then inside the nidocyte, they have what's called the nematocyst. Okay, so this is an area where there's like a thread that's coiled out and there's a trigger associated with that. So when that trigger is activated, that that threaded that um, thread uh, basically discharges. So it, it leaves the, the inside of the, the cell, which is where the nematocyst is. So um, then it's going to uh, pierce into its prey. So you can see uh, that happening over here. Um, so Tentacles that have the nidocytes, uh, of course, those are the ones that are meant to, uh, you know, capture prey. And the nidocytes uh, have that nematocyst that's inside. It's actually considered an organelle, okay? So it's, it's a specialized organelle in which nidocytes have. So you can call it an organelle. So these are some examples of nidaria. Nidaria diverge or split into two major clades, the medusazoa and the anthozoa. Okay, so these are a couple examples of medusazoans, and these are a couple examples of anthozoans. So let's look at the major difference. Just looking at them, you can see that the medusazoans, that's why they're called medusazoans, they exist, they have a medusa stage, and they're in their life cycle. The anthozoans may or may not life cycle and as we discussed previously we have uh, basically it's it's alternating between this polyp medusa stage so as we can see and we have uh, so I'll go ahead and start here uh, with the medusa stage because this is the modal stage and this is where sexual reproduction will occur so they produce uh, gonads so you could either have a, a male or a female and uh, of course the female is going to release eggs and the male will release sperm into the water and then um, you know they're they're formed of course by meiosis they're haploid, and then when they fuse together, fertilization occurs and creates a zygote. So then it goes through the stages that we discussed the other day. And then we have the larval stage. Okay, so it, it starts out at this larval stage. It's called the planula. And then it starts to develop. Now it's attached to something. Okay, so it's starting to develop. It's starting to um, mature into a, a polyp. And then they can live in a colonial type lifestyle. So they can live in a colony or as a colony of polyps. So uh, you can see that we have uh, those uh, those polyps that have certain functions in the colony. Okay, so some of them are feeding polyps and some of them are going to be the reproductive polyps. The reproductive polyps are going to result in um, basically uh, develop into a medusa. The medusa is the modal form, okay? So the reproductives, these are going to stay and feed, and then these are going to leave the, the uh, reproductive polyp, which eventually is going to turn into the medusa, is going to leave and then reproduce. It's going to be, be, become modal. Now, these are some example, other examples of medusazoa. As you can see, they um, just within this particular group, they are quite diverse. Uh, this is a cube or box jelly. Cubozoa. So, um, you know, some of these you may have seen before, some of them may, you may not.
they're quite uh, interesting as well. Some of them can produce light under the water. Okay, so let's move on to anthozoans. So anthozoans is the second major group of Nideria. Um, so this includes the corals and the sea anemone. These only occur as polyps. So they're very similar to uh, the hydrozoans, or specifically the hydra, which belong to the hydrozoans, uh, but they, they're not hydrozoans, they're, they're anthozoans. So uh, the coral, uh, so those can live in a symbiotic relationship with algae. Of course, algae are going to be able to provide food for them because they are autotrophs. The, um, the corals actually secrete a, a exoskeleton, which is quite hard. Um, this creates the external skeleton of the coral. What happens is each generation grows on the remains of the previous generation. Okay, so it, it develops the skeleton, and then the new generation kind of grows on top of the, the, the uh, previous generation skeleton. This forms rocks. And, um, and, you know, you've heard of this before, in the coral, it's important that we keep coral because it provides habitat for other species. Okay, so there's other species that live in there, fish and, and all types of organisms. And these are some other examples of anthozoa. Now we're going to move on to Lophotrochozoa. Lophotrochozoa are one of the two major groups of uh, protostomes. Okay, so the other major group is uh, ectisozoa. We're going to start with Lophotrochozoa. Lophotrochozoa, um, they, their whole clade was identified by molecular data, and it seems to be the widest, widest range of different uh, animal body forms. So uh, bilaterians, again, they have bilateral symmetry. Those that are bilaterian also have triploblastic development, meaning that during development there are uh, three germ layers. Most of them have a coelom and a digestive tract with two openings. Okay, so remember we saw some things where the digestive tract only had one opening, which served as the mouth and the anus. Now um, we're dealing with animals that have, or for the most part, have a digestive tract that have two openings. So um, we're going to go ahead and, and discuss the so some of them develop what's called a lophophore. The lophophore is this large structure like here. Like I said, it looks like uh, very large cilia, but they're just long extensions, and that helps them feed. So they kind of um, wave in the food into their mouth area uh, where they're going to feed on it. Some of them during their life cycle, they pass through a trochophore. Uh, the trochophore stage, uh, the trochophore stage is the larval stage. Both of these stages involve some sort of cilia or some structures that act like cilia. So those that pass through a trochophore stage, this is where the cilia are uh, present, uh, where they may not be present in the adult stage. Um, few of them have neither of these two features. So there are some that don't have a lophophore or a trochophore or ex pass through a trochophore stage. Okay, so these are some examples or the major groups of Lophotrochozoa include flatworms, rotifers, ectoprox, brachiopods, mollusks, and annelids. So let's look at each one of these groups. Flatworms. Flatworms, the name of the phylum is platyhelminths. Okay, so these live in all different types of environments. It could be in water, fresh or marine, or just in damp uh, habitats on, on, uh, out of water. Uh, flatworms do undergo triploblastic development, meaning that they have, again, the three germ layers, uh, but they are acelomates, so they don't have that uh, body cavity. They are one example that has a gastrovascular cavity with only one opening. Gas exchange occurs via the surface. Okay, so these worms are flat. When you flatten something, it increases surface area. So this helps with the gas exchange. Okay, so it, it just happens by diffusion. 
They have these structures called protonephridia, which actually regulate the osmotic balance in them. Okay, so they can live in fresh water or salt water, but it, it regulates the amount of water that they take on um, via the protonephridia. They have, they're flattened, like I said, it's, it's flattened dorsoventrally. So remember, dorsal and ventral uh, sides of organisms. And again, this maximizes uh, surface area. Uh, which allows gas exchange to be a little bit more efficient. Now, kind of going back to some other things that you might have learned in General Biology 1 uh, regarding surface area, or uh, in this particular class, uh, are a number of different ways to maximize surface area. So we just recently saw, you know, that the flatworms, they're flattened, so uh, increases surface area dorsal ventrally. And then remember, we have branching too. So remember, we just got through the uh, the fungus chapter, and remember those hyphae, uh, which create the mycelium, which could be hundreds of hectares in, in distance. So um, again, all of this branching can increase uh, surface area. Again, increase a couple other examples of increasing surface area are uh, the thylakoid membranes. So these are uh, flattened stacks of membrane inside the chloroplast. Also in the in the mitochondrion, where uh, the inner membrane actually starts to fold upon itself, uh, called the cristae. Again, that increases surface area. And in some animal cells, uh, they have uh, microvilli. Microvilli, again, um, the purpose of it is really extensions of the plasma membrane, which allow uh, an increase of surface area. These microvilli or these cells that have microvilli are uh, often found in the digestive system of, of some animals. So let's look at the flatworms a little bit more in detail. The flatworms are going to be divided up into two lineages, the catenolidia, or the catenolida, and the rebdidophora. The catenolida are the chain worms, so they look like individual cells, and, and they really were individual cells, and they re reproduce by asexual budding. So remember budding? We, I talked about that with the hydra, and also we saw the example with the yeast. And the yeast can create pseudohyphae by budding and creating these long chains of, of things that look like uh, hyphae. Well, these are individual animal cells that are going to reproduce asexually by budding, and they create these, these long chains of cells. The rhabdinophora are a little bit more diverse in terms of structure, and um, they can be free-living and parasitic. So some of them, you know, need to obtain their nutrients from a host of some sort, and some of them can re live freely. An example that can live freely are planaria. Planaria are friendly, okay, so they're not going to hurt you. They, they live in fresh water, and they just prey on small animals. So you can see an example of a planarian right here. You can see the eyes. This is a little bit closer structure of the planarian. Uh, planaria are uh, hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both male and female sexual structures. They can reproduce sexually or asexually by fission, similar to that of bacteria. What's interesting about planaria, well, we're dealing with animals now, uh, is that uh, they have bilateral symmetry. And usually bilateral symmetry is associated with, or at least um, a central nervous system is associated with bilateral symmetry. So they have a rudimentary central nervous system. They have uh, nerve nets, okay, and they have ganglia uh, where the nerves nets are kind of centralized. In this area, they do have eye spots, which are actually light sensitive. So they they have these nerves, which can they can sense things. Okay, so you can see that their gastrovascular cavity is quite a large, complicated network along the length of the flat body. Now, um, the other another group of uh, rhabdidophorans, uh, these are two major groups within that group. They're, uh, they're trematodes and tapeworms. So these are generally the parasitic form. Trematodes are going to, uh, they, they're parasitic for a number of different organisms. They all have quite complex life cycles. And the, the overriding part of the life cycle is, or the structures are the sexual structures in most cases. They can alternate between sexual and asexual stages, and they can um, mimic their host by producing surface proteins, which help uh, uh, prevent um, you know, the immune system from recognizing it as foreign. 
and um, they can release molecules that again um, manipulate the uh, the immune system. So they can they can avoid attack by the immune system, so um, they can survive inside the host. So here you can see this is an example of trematode. Or a couple examples. They're usually, uh, you know, flukes of some sort. They're called. So you can see this has uh, the testes right here in the uterus. So this is hermaphroditic, and um, this is the mouth. Okay, and then the gut is down here, and then um, that's pretty much the major structures that you should know about. This would be an example of a life cycle of a fluke. So um, they can alternate between uh, multiple hosts. In this case, we have uh, a snail, which can transmit it to the human. And then the human would be really the final uh, destination where uh, the organism is going to feed off of the, um, uh, of the nutrients uh, in which the human consumes. The tapeworms are a bit more, um, I guess, derived and, and uh, a lot larger. These are going to be uh, parasites, uh, specifically of vertebrates. Okay, so they're not like the trematodes, which can uh, parasitize uh, several different types of organisms. This is only limited to vertebrates. They do not have a digestive system, but they have an extremely um, uh, 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 derived uh, reproductive system. So they're going to absorb nutrients from the host's intestine. Uh, they have at the tip of them, which is called the scolex, and at the tip of the scolex they have suckers in which they basically attach to the digestive system or the wall of the gut and then uh, basically take all the nutrients from from the uh, the host. Now the scolex is really the only part that obtains the nutrients. All of the rest of it, it includes these. Uh, it's the whole, whole. The rest of it is the re reproductive system. It consists of these sections called proglottids, and um, inside the proglottids are the reproductive structures. As we can see, we have the proglottids. These are the sex organs, and um, there are many of them. Uh, so these these fertilized eggs are going to be produced by sexual reproduction. They're going to leave the host body host host body via the feces, and this is how it's easily spread around uh, via feces. The next major group are the rotifers. The rotifers are generally microscopic. They're very small animals that live in water or in damp soil. I've actually seen them in pond water. I've found some of those. They're actually uh, truly multicellular. They don't live in a, meaning they don't live in a, co a colonial lifestyle, and they have very specialized organ systems. Look at this. They have a bladder. They have an intestine, a stomach, an esophagus, um, eyes, a mouth. Right. So, um, so they have a lot of structures that are, you know, common to even humans. Uh, what's interesting is they have this, these coronas right here, they're ciliated and they really like spin around and it allows them to feed on, on, uh, particles that live in the water. They have an alimentary canal, which is basically a digestive tube with a separate mouth and anus that lies, uh, within a fluid filled coelom. Okay, so here we can see the crown of cilia around here. We have the mouth area. This would be the stomach, and then, of course, this would be the anus. So they have basically two different areas, one way in and one way out. Lucky for them. And, um, again, this is going to be a fluid-filled uh, pseudocelum. So they're pseudocelomates. They reproduce by parthenogenesis, which is basically uh, females reproduce or produce offspring from un unfertilized eggs. So they don't need men. So um, no, they don't have need. They don't don't actually need the male form of uh, the uh, rotifers. So uh, they can actually produce offspring from unfertilized eggs. So there's no need for sperm. And some of the species actually, you know, the males are obsolete. Lophophorates split into two major categories, which are the ectoprox and the brachiopods. Uh, lophophorates have a lophophore. Okay, so uh, even though all of these that we're talking about belong to Lophotrochozoa, the two that actually, the two major groups that actually have a lophophore are the lophophorates. Okay, that's why they're called that, and they are the ectoprox and the brachiopods. Okay, so the lophophore, as you can see, is basically ciliated tentacles. So they're like tentacles, and they have cilia, like I mentioned, and it's, it's immediately around their mouth. 
Okay, so their mouth is, is uh, basically, it leads to a tunnel which, which serves as their mouth. And that is shown here as well. You can see the esophagus uh, down, leading down the canal from that lophophore. They do have a true coelom, so they are coelomate. And again, these are the two groups here. The ectoprocs are also called bryozoans. These are sessile animals, and they're going to be attached to some substrate. And you can see they have the lophophores. You can see all the lophophores in all of these groups. They're quite interesting looking. They are colonial animals. They very much similar uh, re resemble plants. They kind of look like plants. They do have a hard exoskeleton that, that basically covers the whole colony. And often you can't really see that exoskeleton. So the exoskeleton kind of holds the colony together. And then, um, you know, what extends out of them is the, uh, the lophophore uh, with those ciliated tentacles. Uh, some of these are part of the, the building of the reefs, the coral reefs and, and such. <clears throat> The bronchiopards are quite interesting. They are marine. They attach to the seafloor by what's called a stock. They look like clams, but they're not. Okay, so um, they are hinged, but they are not mollusks. Okay, so it's important to remember remember that they're not mollusks. The two halves of the shell are um, dorsal and ventral versus lateral, in, as in the clams. Okay, so... It's dorsal ventral uh, versus the lateral, and you can see the lophophore is inside this, so this is a lamp shell. So these are some ex other examples of brachiopods. Now we're going to move on to the mollusks, which are very similar to the bryozoans, but they're not. Remember, uh, in, in terms of their, their shells, they're, they're uh, 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 lateral. So mollusks include the snails, slugs, oysters, clams, octopus, and squid. Not all of them have a shell that uh, obviously that, that uh, encases the, the soft part of the body. Most of them are marine, even though some do live in fresh water. Uh, some snails and slugs are terrestrial, so you know they live in water or some of them can live on land. So the, in terms of their lifestyle, it's quite diverse as well. Uh, they are actually soft-bodied animals. Okay, so um, some of them are protected by a shell. Okay, so the brachiopods have the shell, the, the, the shell is part of their body, um, but uh, here these are actually soft-bodied animals that, uh, in which some of them have a shell and some of them do not. All mollusks have a similar body plan. Okay, so there's three major parts of this body plan. There's the foot, the visceral mass, and the mantle. The mantle basically makes the shell in those organisms that that uh, that have a shell. The visceral mass has all of their organs, so that would be the soft part of the body in which all the organs exist. And the foot allows them to move around. Okay, so the foot allows them, and that's how they move around. That's why it's called the foot. Okay, so they do have a separate mouth and anus. The mantle cavity is basically just interior to the mantle. Okay, so the mantle cavity is going to be where the visceral mass exists. They can feed like they have teeth. Okay, so they, they can feed on things uh, almost like chewing it. Okay, so at their mouth they have what's called the radula. And it's, it's like teeth. It's, it's rasp-like, so it allows them to chew things. I've actually seen a snail eat... Uh, grass. Uh, most of them have separate sexes, and the gonads are going to be located inside the visceral mass, of course, um, but some of them are also hermaphroditic. The life cycle of many of these mollusks, they, they have this uh, larval stage uh, called the trochophore, like I mentioned earlier. So this is one example of those organisms that are the uh, lophophorates, or not the lophophorates, but the um, lophotrochozoa that uh, pass through the trochophore stage. As you can you notice here, they don't have a lophophore, so they're not actually lophophorates, they're lophotrochozoa. There are four major classes of mollusks. There's the polyplacophora or the chitons, the gastropoda, which include the snails and the slugs, 
the bivalves, which include the uh, those lateral uh, hinged uh, shell organisms, the clams, oysters, and other bivalves, and the cephalopoda. The cephalopoda include squid, octopus, cuttlefish, and uh, nautilus. Let's look at each one of those. The chitons or the polyplacophora are distinctive in that they have eight dorsal plates. So on the outside of them or on the dorsal surface, there's uh, plates and there's specifically eight of them. Their foot acts like a suction cup and it allows them to grip and walk over a uh, rock. And they have a radula, which is like the teeth. Remember, this allows them to feed. So they actually scrape the algae off of the rock as they walk across it. Gastropods, this makes up about 75% of all mollusks. Okay, so set, most of the mollusks are actually gastropods. So a couple examples are the snails and the sea slug you can see here. Gastropods are marine, but many of them live in freshwater and, and also terrestrial, so they live on land. Uh, they move very slowly, and there's this rippling motion of the foot. Um, sometimes some of them have cilia, which allows them to move around. Most of them have a single spiraled shell. Of course, this is going to protect them from injury and, of course, predators and prevent dehydration. Most of them are herbivores, so they're going to feed on plants. And some species use a modified radula to feed on prey. Okay, so they have a modified type of radula, which is, remember, the, the teeth-like projections. Bivalves are aquatic and they include many species. Uh, they have, uh, this includes the clams, oysters, uh, mussels, and scallops. Uh, some of them have eyes and sensory tentacles. So you can see that here. So you can see how they open up. It's, it's more uh, lateral rather than the dorsal ventral like uh, the, uh, the brachiopods. Um, most of them are sedentary, uh, and you know some of them have limited motility, mobility or motility, same thing. Uh, so they're generally going to be, they're not going to move around a whole lot. They have a shell that's divided into two halves, and it can be drawn together by muscles. They're called the adductor muscles. Okay, so the adductor muscles close them very tightly. If you've ever tried to open up a clam or a scallop while it was still living, um, it would be very difficult. Okay, so it's difficult to open it. When you do your dissection, you'll get a chance to, um, it, it, this is a dead one too, and it's it's been clamped shut pretty much, uh, except something is there to prevent it from being completely shut because you need to be able to try to open it. You'll, you'll get a chance to look at that. Again, these are the similar structures as uh, the other group. They have a mantle, which produces the shell. They have the mouth, and then they have this visceral mass all around here. Um, the mantle cavity is just inside the mantle. Um, the gills provide gas exchange. Okay, so this is how they breathe. It's almost like a rudimentary lung, if you will. And then, of course, the shell, and then the coelom. So they're true coelomates. They have a body cavity. And this uh, shows one of the two adductor muscles. So there's one here and one over here. And there's, of course, a separate mouth and anus. OK. Cephalopods are uh, a lot more well-developed. These are generally carnivores, so they're going to feed on other organisms. They have jaws that look like beaks. And they're surrounded by tentacles. So the tentacles help them feed. Um, they do have a modified foot, so it's not like the foot of the other two groups. They um, generally immobilize their prey with a poison in their saliva. Cephalopods are quite interesting. They have a circulatory system, they have well-developed sense organs, and they have a complex brain. So cephalo means like we're dealing with the central nervous system, so um, they do have quite complex central nervous systems. Um, annelids are, are basically the worms, okay, or other forms, not flatworms, okay, so those are generally, these are just generally going to be the brown worms, but some don't look like worms, okay, so these are coelomate, okay, so annelids are coelomate, so they have a true coelom, and um, their bodies are made up of like a, a series of rings that are fused together. Okay, so the phylum annelid was basically originally divided up into three clades, the polycheta, the oligocheta, and the harunid, uh, Harunidae, which is the leeches, 
but um, after, you know, of course, now we have better sequencing, DNA sequencing technology, uh, they, they're divided up into two major clades, the Orantia and the Sedentaria. The Orantians uh, are mostly the, the mobile organisms. They're generally marine. They have um, these this pair of paddle-like uh, or ridge-like structures called parapodia. So they're pairs of feet. Okay, so it's beside the feet, and they have pairs of them on either side. This is not unique to this clade, so it's not special characteristic for Orantians only. Um, so we'll we'll see that again later. Uh, the parapodium have uh, numerous chete, which are bristles made of chitin. Okay, so they have bristles on the parapodia. Sedentarians are not as mobile. Okay, so generally these are going to be sedentary. So they're going to kind of uh, uh, be attached to some sort of substance. Some of them burrow into a particular substrate. Others live in tubes, or tube, they're called tube dwelling, uh, so they're, the tubes are there to protect them. Often they have elaborate gills or tentacles. They are filter feeders as well. Look how beautiful these are. This is an example of a Christmas tree worm. A couple examples. Leeches, uh, they generally live in fresh water, but some of them are marine and some of them live on land. Uh, they, are, they, they can predate uh, invertebrate or animals. They can, as parasites, they're going to suck blood of, of organisms. What they can do is basically secrete this called uh, this chemical called hirudin, which actually prevents blood from coagulating. So it allows them to feed on the blood uh, after they've penetrated the skin. Uh, they're generally hermaphroditic. And um, they've actually been used in medicine to remove blood from patients. Uh, I guess after a patient has died, um, also to help treat wounds. And then we have earthworms. They generally eat through the soil, so the soil kind of runs, uh, moves through their uh, their digestive system, which is called the alimentary canal. Uh, they're hermaphroditic uh, and they uh, cross fertilize so uh, it's basically between each other uh, so one part of them is the male and it matches up with the female of the other and then one part is the female it matches up with the male of, of another worm. Uh, some of them can reproduce uh, asexually by fragmentation so you can break them up and then they'll, they'll uh, regenerate into two worms. This is a, a giant wor earthworm right here. Look how large that is. And these are some, a couple other examples of them. You'll get a chance to dissect an earthworm in the lab. These are some structures that I'll probably ask you to try to identify. Uh, again, they're coelomates, so they have a true body cavity or a coelom. There is a septum, which is basically uh, partitions the segments. So remember, there are fused segments. There's a septum in between each segment, but there's an area where the alimentary canal or the intestine can run all the way along the length of the organism. So these are going to split into sections, partitions, but uh, still the digestive system can run all the way through through the center of the septum, septa. There is a separate mouth and anus. They have uh, ganglia, which serve as uh, their rudimentary nervous system. These are the cerebral ganglia, and then um, they have nerve cords or ventral nerve cords that run along the length of the organism. And then the central area is the intestine. Okay, so this is the space, the digestive area. Oh, let's see. The clitellum is basically where the reproductive structures are. And it does have a circulatory system, and uh, I believe in your book it, it does point out uh, five hearts, which are um, like uh, areas where the blood might be, I guess, pumped uh, throughout the body of the organism. Then we're gonna uh, we're gonna move on to the second part of proto or uh, protostomes. Okay, so remember protostomes exist as Lophotrochozoa and Ecdysozoa. Ecdysozoa will be the final section uh, regarding protostomes. I need a break. All right, back from my break. Ecdysozoans are, um, they exist in, they're a relatively small group, but they have the most, almost the most amount of spe different species that, that uh, there is. 
what makes them ectoisozoa is that they have a tough coat called the cuticle, and they undergo uh, a process called molting. Uh, this is called, uh, or a process called ectysis, but uh, it's basically shedding or molting of this, this tough cuticle as they get larger or as they grow. The two major groups of ectoisozoans include the nematodes and the arthropods. The arthropods are probably the largest one. Nematodes are just simply roundworms. Uh, most of them live in aquatic habitats uh, or uh, in the soil, which is near, you know, in moist uh, areas, moist tissues of plants, and uh, sometimes the body fluids of, of animals. They do also have an alimentary canal similar to the earthworms. They do not have a circulatory system though, so that's a little bit different from the earthworms. And uh, they do have uh, muscles that run along, along the length of the body. Uh, and when these muscles contract, it produces this thrashing motion. An example of one of these is Trichinella spirillis. Uh, this, can be, this can be obtained by humans from uh, eating undercooked pork. I'm sure you've heard of you know, being sick due to that. And it's due to this organism, Trichinella spirillis. So we can see uh, they do form cysts, uh, and these are the juveniles right here, so you can see they're encysted, they're, they exist in these, these cyst-like structures. <clears throat> um, and they're gonna be housed in the, the muscle of, of humans. Arthropods, uh, so like I said, the nematodes is quite small. The arthropods make up most of this group of organisms. So uh, two th thirds of all species of animals are actually arthropods. Um, they're found in all kinds of habitats all over the place. The body plan of an arthropod includes the following. They have a segmented body, they have a hard exoskeleton, that's why they're ectoisozoa, and they have jointed, jointed appendages. Okay, so this, this shows a, a, a fossilized uh, early example of a trilobite. During the course of evolution, um, the, you know, regarding if we compare the arthropods from, let's say, the annelids, where they have a large number of segments, well, um, as we move into arthropods, the number of segments starts to decrease. But the amount of appendages attached to those segments start to increase in specialization. Um, remember, animals have the hox genes, and um, it's uh, arthropods that basically wear this special set of hox genes, uh, the, the UBX and the uh, ABDA hox genes uh, arose in this, this particular. <clears throat> and it's thought that the, it contributed to these differences. The appendages of some of the, the living arthropods uh, are, ha, have a number of different functions. Okay, so some of these functions include walking, feeding, uh, being able to sense things, reproduction, defense. Um, so arthropods have they have eyes, which is a part of uh, you know being able to see where they're walking first of all and and sense things olfactory receptors, which basically give them a, a sense of smell, and antenna, antenna to, to, for the sense of touch. Uh, you can see that some of them have pincers, which are one of those examples for defense. Uh, they do have mouth parts, which allow them to help feed, and then um, legs, which help them uh, walk. And then sometimes there are appendages that which uh, you know help them swim. Okay, so this would be these uh, swimmerettes that are in the uh, the lobster. So um, they generally come in pairs and. Like I said, uh, this is a characteristic of arthropods. The body of the arthropod is covered, so the, the soft part of the body is covered by the cuticle, and this is the exoskeleton. It's made of layers of protein and the polysaccharide chitin. So remember, we talked about chitin before. It makes up the cell wall of, of a, a, a fungi, but also uh, the exoskeleton of arthropods. As the organism grows, it it molds its exoskeleton, so ectosis uh, basically occurs, so it basically sheds the exoskeleton and rebuilds it as it gets larger. Arthropods have an open circulatory system, um, which, which contains what's called hemolymph, so it could be somewhat analogous to the human circulatory system, except it's an open system. 
um, it does have a, a an immune role as well. Morphological and molecular evidence suggests that uh, the arthropods are divided up into three major lineages. Okay, so and these three diverged early on in the evolution of, or thought to have diverged uh, early on the evolution of of arthropods. These include the chelicerates, the myriapods, and the pan crustaceans. So the chelicerates include the spiders and the horseshoe crabs, uh, the ticks and mites, uh, scorpions. Uh, myriapods include the centipedes and the millipedes, and the pan crustaceans include the lobsters and other crustaceans, which we will see some examples and insects as well. Chelicerates, these are the ones that uh, diverged earliest. Uh, so uh, the earliest ones were uh, water scorpions or eurypterids. Most of them are marine um, and most of the eurypterids are actually extinct. The only surviving species today are the horseshoe crabs. Um, most of the modern trilicerates are arachnids, so you know, we'll see spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites. Uh, they do have specialized feeding appendages called trilicerae. These are claw-like feeding appendages. And the anterior end of uh, the cephalothorax and the posterior abdomen. So these are the two major um, uh, sections within them. Arachnids have six pairs of appendages. Okay, so uh, they have chelicerae, which are meant for feeding and defense. They have the pedipalps, which are meant for uh, feeding and local motion, sometimes reproduction, and four pairs of legs for walking. Gas exchange occurs via the book lungs. Okay, so uh, they have uh, respiratory organs. Many spiders also produce silk. Um, these uh, are, the silk is produced from uh, uh, glands that are in the abdomen. Uh, these are specialized to produce this pr pr protein. Myriapods include the centipedes and the uh, millipedes. Uh, all of these are terrestrial, uh, or at least they exist today. Uh, they have one pair of attenda, uh, attenae, antennae and then three pairs of append appendages modified as mouth parts. Um, <clears throat> The millipedes and the centipedes have some differences between them. Millipedes are herbivores, centipedes are carnivores. Millipedes have many legs uh, with two pairs per trunk or segment. Okay, so they have many segments, but only two pairs of legs for them, or with two pairs of legs in each one of them. So they're millipedes, so you would think that there's a lot more legs in them. And then centipedes only one, have one pair of legs per trunk or segment. Um, centipedes also have claws that have poison, uh, so this allows them to, uh, as they capture the prey, they can paralyze the prey, and it helps aid in defense of uh, predators. Pan, pan crustaceans, um, this includes inst insects and other larger crustaceans, which you probably know uh, a lot about. <clears throat> so as you can see, um, we have some some crustacean groups that might branch off that is really in terms of their evolutionary relationship is not quite certain as we can see um we have these are the this is the common ancestor of our, our all arthropods we have the chelicerates and the myriapods and then we have all the other crustaceans crustaceans they can live in marine and freshwater environments generally in water at some point they have very highly specialized appendages the small crustaceans uh, have a gas exchange through a, the cuticle. The larger ones have gills, which are like rudimentary lungs. Uh, most of them have separate males and females, so they're not hermaphroditic. Uh, isopods are quite interesting. These are little roly polies that you um, that you probably heard of. They can kind of roll up and, and uh, ball themselves up. So it helps protect them. These are called. These are actually pill bugs. Um, these are an example of an isopod. Uh, they are terrestrial, freshwater, and marine species. Crustaceans include uh, the decapods. Uh, so we have the isopods and the, the decapods. Uh, these are generally the larger crustaceans, which include the, the lobsters, the crabs, crayfish, and the shrimp. And then we have some that are planktonic, so these are very, very small. This includes many species of copepods. Uh, these are the among, among the n most numerous of all animals. Uh, an example would be the shrimp-like krill, like this. 
Barnacles actually belong to the uh, big category called uh, crustaceans. These are actually ones that are sessile, sessile so they don't have any specialized uh, appendages meant for moving around. They have a cuticle which is hardened to, uh, into a calcium carbonate shell. So they look like the uh, the uh, the other organisms that have shells, but but they're not. And then insects, they belong to this large group. It's a very, very large group called hexapod. Uh, most of them are terrestrial. Some of them live in water. They have very complex organ systems. So these are just some examples and of, of some insects and the orders in which they belong. You don't have to memorize any major orders, um, any, any uh, specific orders, I mean. Um, so the insects, they're... They're diversified of a number of different uh, things that make them quite diverse is, is uh, that, you know, this, this, uh, a lot of them can fly. So the evolution of flight uh, kind of existed in this particular clade. Uh, certain, um, certain uh, abilities to actually feed on gymnosperms. Remember the gymnosperms are the very, uh, one of the two major groups of, of, of uh, plants. It includes pine trees and, and the ginkgo. And uh, this contributed, they diversified along with the expansion of uh, angiosperms. Remember, insects, uh, they help angiosperms, uh, you know, reproduce, right? So they're going to carry uh, their the pollen around. So uh, again, the insects are going to kind of um, evolve along with plants in those cases. Um, what's key about insects, they do have uh, segments. Uh, they generally, not all of them, they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They do have a more complex uh, a nervous system. Uh, they have cerebral uh, ganglion. They have nerve cords. Uh, they do have a mouth and a trachea. Um, this one shows the ovaries right here. And then, you know, they have heart. Okay, so they have a, 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 a circulatory system and specialized mouth parts. So the key thing here is, is yes, they do have a, a central nervous system, and it's not as rudimentary as some of the earlier animals that we spoke of, but uh, it's not like humans, of course. Um, but, but what's special about these are uh, the specialized appendages. Flight, again, it, this contributed to the great success of insects. It allowed them to, uh, you know, escape predators. It led them to actually f go find food somewhere, it, especially, you know, it's, it, the ability to move to another environment is, is helpful when there's scarce food sources. And um, so it allowed them to divert, uh, basically uh, move to new habitats and actually reproduce with other uh, uh, populations, which, uh, you know, increase variation within the population. Um, the uh, in, the wings of insects are are basically an extension of the cuticle often um, so you can see that uh, we have the it's basically you know part of the cuticle you can see sometimes there are wings that are underneath the the cuticle part um, this shows a ladybird right here as it's flying so you can see the cuticle is it provides some flight ability Many go, uh, insects undergo metamorphosis. Uh, so remember, we talked about metamorphosis before. Um, there's two types of metamorphosis. Uh, there's incomplete metamorphosis, where the organism uh, really passes through a couple stages that are very similar to the adult form. They're young or nymphs. They, they look like the adult form. It's just they're smaller. Okay, so they, they go, just go through a series of molts or ectysis until they reach the full size. As opposed to incomplete metamorphosis, there's also complete metamorphosis. So this is where they have several larval stages, and um, they each have names. Uh, for example, here we have the uh, the larva, the pupa, and then we have a later stage of the pupa. Sometimes they're, they might be called a, a maggot or a grub. Uh, caterpillar might be one one of the stages, and then um, but again, each of the stages look very different from the adult stage. So here we can see a monarch butterfly. This is the final adult stage. Here it looks significantly different from the pupa and young adult stage, and especially the larval stage. Most insects have separate male and females in their in their um, 
and their species within the species. They reproduce sexually. Uh, they, they basically find, a lot of them can find and recognize members of their own species by um, using bright colors, sound, and odors. They do contribute to, again, I mentioned uh, the, uh, you can watch this video yourself. Uh, they do contribute to uh, the diversification of plants because they, uh, they in part allow the plants to uh, reproduce because they pollinate. Um, some of them are, are carriers of diseases, so they can be harmful to plants as well. Um, insects are classified into over 30 orders. So that's, again, I'm not going to require you to know the orders. Just know uh, maybe a couple examples of the orders. So you can see the first to branch off are the Archaeonantha, uh, which are the bristletails. This is an example of one right here. Then we have the Zyg... Uh, Zyg Zygenotoma, which is a uh, silverfish. And then we have the winged insects. So these are the ones with the wings, and these undergo metamorphosis. Uh, we have those that undergo complete metamorphosis and those that undergo incomplete metamorphosis. Um, so these are just some uh, examples of, of common insects and uh, their associated orders. Now this is really a summary of all the uh, protostomes, right? So this part of this chapter covers uh, Echinodermata, but um, I'm going to apply that to the Deuterostomes chapter. So you won't need to uh, cover that today, but also you will need to uh, make that part of your study at some point for chapter 34. All right, thank you for listening.